Hello there, brothers and sisters in Christ. God bless each and every single one of you. It is Hunter's Point here with another video. I do hope and pray that each of you all watching are having a good Tuesday morning so far, wherever you all are at. I do hope and pray that each of you are all doing well. I wanted to come on here and give you all a Prophecy Watch update. Uh, as I know, it's been just over a week since I last detailed the events going on in Israel as it pertains to Iran and the uh, attacks, the missiles that have been exchanged. But I wanted to follow up on that now and give a Prophecy Watch update of sorts. So without any further ado, I'm not going to waste any more time. This is your World News Update for the 23rd of April, 2024. The article is off of endtimeheadlines.org and will be linked in the description box below as per the usual. Again, this is a Prophecy Watch update. Will the nations impose a peace agreement upon Israel? We know what that would be a precursor of. Look at that. This uh, last week, when Iran unleashed its barrage of 350 drones and missiles against the Jewish state, maybe the most surprising aspect was that Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates supported Israel. Let that sink in for a moment. All these nations are opposed to what Israel is doing in Gaza. They're not friendly with Israel in every respect. However, these three nations supported Israel against an aggressive attack from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Even Jordan took part in shooting down Iranian missiles. You could say these missiles were over their airspace. They would obviously shoot them down. Well, years ago... They would have been glad to have any missiles flying over their airspace knowing that the target was Israel. Other Arab nations, like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, provided valuable intelligence to Israel about the timing of the attack. According to reports, Iran tipped off Saudi Arabia as to what it was doing and when it would do it. Saudi Arabia then secretly passed that information along to Israel to give them a heads up for the timing of of this attack, something that would have been unthinkable even just a few years ago. The support of these nations for Israel has astounding prophetic significance in the setup of the Ezekiel 38 Gog Magog War, in which a coalition of nations in the end times Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and maybe other Islamic nations as well will invade Israel through the northern border, if you remember, according to the prophecy. According to Ezekiel 38, there must be peace and rest in Israel before the invasion occurs. This is an essential precondition for the Gog-Magog invasion. Ezekiel 38, verses 8 to 9, as well as verse 11, tells us what must be in place for the Gog-Magog invasion. After many days, you will be called to arms, referring to the Gog coalition. In future years, you will invade a land that is recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations and now all live safely. Not only does Israel need to be regathered and brought from the nations that occurred back in 1948, but they will also have to be living, at least in some state, of safety. They'll have to be living in safety. Verse 9 continues. You and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up, advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. Verse 11 then states, You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and gates and bars. That doesn't necessarily describe Israel today. Israel will eventually have some sense of security, and let down its guard. I believe that will happen because of a covenant or treaty that the Antichrist will make to bring peace to that part of the world. I tend to agree with that analysis. That will likely have to be in place before the Gog-Magog invasion occurs. What we're witnessing today is more and more willing peace partners for Israel among these Arab neighbors. That is something that we have not seen since 1948. And it is a necessary precondition for the beginning of the tribulation period where the Antichrist will forge a peace agreement with Israel. 
Daniel 9.27 says, He, meaning the prince, antichrist that is coming, will confirm, you can also translate that word as compel or complete, a covenant with many for one, seven, set of seven years. In the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. The event that starts the seven-year tribulation period is this peace treaty that the Antichrist makes and forges with Israel and its neighbors. Revelation chapter 6 tells us that the tribulation period begins when a rider on a white horse rides forth and brings about a great diplomatic victory. This matches the Antichrist who is coming to confirm the peace agreement. After this, in Revelation 19, we have Jesus coming back to earth on a white horse in victory. Revelation 6 is the beginning of the tribulation when this counterfeit Messiah rides forth on his white horse, conquering and to conquer. It describes him as having a bow with no arrows, so his conquest is diplomatic. It's a bloodless conquest, and he is going to make this peace agreement with Israel and her neighbors. That peace condition will be the uh, precondition for the Gog-Magog war that will occur in the tribulation period. And of course, we know how the tribulation period, not only how it's going to go according to the scriptures, but also how it's going to end. Spoiler alert, God is victorious. All right, that is where I'm going to conclude your news update, your Prophecy Watch update for April 23rd. I'm going to go ahead and pull up eSword, which is my online digital Bible program. And we are going to go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. This is the saving gospel message. This is how you are saved if you believe this alone in your heart. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel, the good news, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Again, that right there is how you are saved if you believe that in your heart alone. That is what it comes down to, right? It's not dependent. Salvation is not dependent upon your ability to do good works or good deeds or follow commandments or obey Jewish law. It's not what it's about. It's about what Jesus Christ did and if you believe in that or not. It all comes down to faith. Have you believed in Jesus Christ alone? for your salvation and eternal security. If not, that's what it takes. Nothing else, just faith. I'm going to go to John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, as I believe they tie in beautifully with the saving gospel message that I just shared with you all. We're going to go ahead and start here, verse 16, and we're going to go all the way to verse 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus did the work. All you have to do if you're a non-believer is believe in him. It really is that simple. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God the Son, the second part of the Trinity. He died on the cross, shedding his precious purifying blood for the remission of all mankind's sins, its past, present, and future sins. He was buried in the tomb three days, proving that he was dead, and he rose again, resurrected on the third day, according to the scriptures for our justification and therefore our salvation. Jesus did the work. All you have to do is believe in him. I'm going to finish here by reading Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We know that grace, by definition, is getting what we don't deserve. That's God's unmerited favor, which God has offered to us as the free gift of salvation 
and we accept and receive that free gift once and for all, past, present, and future, by faith alone in the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ alone. See, we know what's coming. Those of us who have studied the Bible and have particularly studied end times events, we know what is soon to come upon this world. But we also know who the solution is. That solution is Jesus Christ. So you can get out of the events that are to come. And that is by becoming a believer right here, right now, when we are still within this church age. And I pray that if you're a non-believer watching this video right now, that you would make that choice. That may right now be the moment of salvation for you, because time is short. You have no idea when your earthly existence is going to come to an end. And believe me when I tell you, you do not want to spend an eternity separated from God. And he doesn't want that for you either. He loved you enough to send his only begotten son to pay your sin debt so that you may have the chance to be saved if you believe. The nanosecond that you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit right then and there. All you have to do is believe. All right, that is where I'm going to leave you all off at for this video. I will see you all in the next video message whenever it is, should the Lord tarry is coming. Otherwise, God bless you all. All right, take care.